So have you ever thought that you were doing something really good only to find out that it wasn't as good as you thought, right? Or that you inadvertently, while you think you're doing something really good, was actually causing a problem to someone that you didn't realize was happening. I mean, there may have been something that ran through your mind just now when I asked you that question. A situation that came up, you said, oh yeah, I've done that before. I think there are countless situations in our world, in our life, where we do that. And I, an example is, you know, we've all heard, or maybe you've heard, the story of the village that's along the river. And the village is needing more water for their crops. And so they get this amazing idea. I'm going to dam up the river. So they do. They dam up the river. They've got all the water that they need. Unfortunately, it's not a good deal for those down the river because they don't have any water now. And so their good deed, the thing they thought was wonderful, ended up being something bad for them. So as I was thinking about this idea this week, I remembered uh, my wedding, my marriage early on. So we had been married for, I don't know, a very short time, my wife and I. And I would come home and I'd walk in and I'd say, oh, there's dishes on the counter. And I would go directly over to the sink and I would start doing those dishes. All the while thinking, this is a good thing. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, look at my good deed. Look at me being a good husband. Except that's not what my wife needed. What my wife actually needed, instead of me coming in from work and immediately going to the kitchen and start doing dishes, what she really needed was for me to maybe acknowledge her when I walked in the door or to say hello or better yet, to go sit down on the couch with her and ask her how her day was and how things were going. You see, I thought I was doing something really good. I thought it was a great thing. And in the end, it was a good thing, but I deceived myself into thinking that it was good without any of these other repercussions. And sometimes that's what happens. And that actually is our topic today. You see, we're in the study of the book, a book of Galatians. And it's a series that we've entitled Freedom. And throughout the book of Galatians, we've talked about a variety of ways that our walk with Christ, that when we walk with Him, when we have a relationship with Him, it gives freedom in our lives and it brings freedom, freedom from bondage to sin, freedom from a whole list of things. And the backdrop of this book of Galatians that there's a, is that there are a group of people who've come in and they're telling the Galatians, <clears throat> excuse me, they're telling the Galatians, you need to start following the rules and the law and all of these things. It's bringing them back into bondage. And so we've compared and contrasted various things all throughout this series. Last week, we talked about the flesh versus the spirit and walking in those two things. And today, our topic is doing good versus being deceived. Doing good, like I'm going to do the dishes right away when I get home and deceiving myself into thinking, that my wife's going to be ecstatic about that even though I'm not engaging with her, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Those things happen in our lives. And so here's the quick, a quick caveat about our, our topic today. Now, this whole idea of doing good here in our text in Galatians, and we're going to be in Galatians chapter 6, the first 10 verses is what we're going to cover today. But Paul in this section isn't talking about doing good in the context of going to heaven and how we can get to heaven. He's actually talking about doing good in the context of those who know Jesus Christ and what it looks like to do good in our lives versus being deceived. And as we walk through the text, we're going to do a couple of things. First of all, we're going to look at some ways that we can do good. What's it look like to do good in our lives as believers? And then we're also going to see some warnings that can happen. Some ways that we can deceive ourselves if we're not careful and if we don't have it on our radar just like I deceived myself in early on in my marriage about what my wife might think, might like, and what she, in fact, ended up liking. And so uh, let's pray, and then we will jump into our text for today. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy in our lives. And Lord, thank you for this book. Thank you for the book of Galatians. Thank you for the, the things that it says to us and what you have for us as a, as a church body as followers of you. And Lord, thank you for the fact that you give us freedom in our walk with you. 
Lord, I pray that right now you would, you would speak to us. Lord, everyone hearing this message, Lord, I pray that you would, you would speak. You know every heart. You know every circumstance and you know every situation. And Lord, we ask that you would speak and that you would move. Lord, would you guide my words that you would give me exactly what you want me to say and in the way that you want it said. And Lord, ultimately, we want you to be glorified and honored by what's done, by what's taught, by what's said. Lord, we lift all this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, let's start off with our first point. The first thing that we can see in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10 is this. Doing good restores others to Christ. Doing good restores others to Christ. Let's pick up our text in verse 1 of Galatians 6. It says this, Paul starts off and he says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, so if a man is overtaken in a, in a sin, and by the way, that, that term brethren, that greeting, you'll see it a variety of times throughout the book of Galatians. And if you think about the book of Galatians, Paul's coming pretty hard at the Galatians, saying, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Calling them foolish a variety of times. Well, that, that term brethren is an endearing term. It's an endearing greeting, isn't it? And Paul starts off there and he says, if anybody is overtaken in doing something wrong, overtaken in a, a trespass or a sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So Paul says, if anyone is overtaken around you, then you who are spiritual. Okay, now, uh, who's he talking about here? You who are spiritual. Well, here's what I think. Remember last week, I said earlier, the context of Galatians chapter 5 that we talked about is walking in the Spirit versus walking in the flesh. And that's what we talked about last, last week. As we mature in our, in our relationship with God, we walk and learn how to walk in the Spirit. And Tim mentioned last week that when we are learn, learning to walk in the Spirit is much like learning to walk physically that early on physically we maybe have somebody helping us along the way and, and we have to think about it and focus on it. But pretty soon, walking just becomes natural. I don't think about walking. I just, I just start walking. And that happens spiritually. And when that happens spiritually, I think that's who Paul's talking about. You who are spiritual, you who are walking in a mature way in the spirit. So he says, talking to those, and then he gives an instruction. He says, restore that person who's fallen. Restore them in the, general of, in the spirit of gentleness. Now, that word restore literally means to put in order. It means to restore something to its former condition. And it was used in a variety of ways in biblical uh, context. It was sometimes used in the context of mending fishnets. You know, fishnets, you're pulling the fish in, they tear. And it was used, the restore word was used in that context. It was also used in a medical context in Greek society. And it was used to talk about the idea of setting a fractured or dislocated bone. It's restoring something to the way it used to be. And Paul says, those who are walking with the Spirit, you look around, and those who are fallen, who who find themselves in a trespass or in a sin, restore those, bring them back, correct them back. But then he says, do it in a specific way. He says, do it in the spirit of gentleness. Now, what's the opposite of that? The opposite of the spirit of gentleness is a spirit, a spirit of harshness, a spirit of judgmental. And we've, we've many have experienced that, haven't we? Where it's like, oh my goodness, I feel really judged. I feel really, uh, that feels really harsh. And then Paul says at the very last phrase there, you need to remember who you are. Consider yourself lest you also be tempted. That's the context in which we should help restore others. Look what he says in verse two. He goes on and he says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now that idea of bear means to endure something. We even use that context today. Like, oh, I'm going to grin and bear it, right? I'm going to endure this until it's over. But the word used for burdens there is this idea of a heavy weight or a stone that someone is carrying or required to carry for a very long time or a very long distance. 
That's the burden that Paul's talking about. And he said, look around and those who are carrying these very heavy burdens, help them bear it. Bear one another's burdens. You see, a piece of doing good is also bearing the burdens of other people. A piece of restoring others to Christ has to do with helping bear their burdens. And we all have burdens, don't we? What burdens are you carrying? What are the burdens that are in your life that you feel like, ah, man, this one's heavy. These things are, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can carry this one on my own. Maybe, maybe yours is a burden of a consequence of sin. Maybe it's a burden, uh, maybe it's a mental illness burden or a physical ailment or a physical illness burden or a financial burden or, or maybe it's some kind of a temptation. But you're burdened. You're feeling heavy and you're feeling like, I don't know if I can carry this one on my own. And restoring others to Christ, it, a piece of that is coming alongside people and helping them bear those burdens. James 1.28, it, just write down the reference if you'd like. Er, James 2.8 says, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. James says, you want to fulfill the law? That's what, that's what Paul says at the end of Galatians 6 too. He says, so fulfill the law of Christ. It, James says, you want to fulfill the law? You love your neighbor as yourself. You see, part of restoring others to Christ is doing this, loving them enough that you'll speak correction to them, that you'll restore them when they have a difficult time. Part of, of, of loving your neighbor is to help bear those burdens together, helping uh, come alongside them. When someone's struggling in their marriage, you listen and you offer godly counsel. When someone's having a difficult time that you come alongside and you help bear those burdens. So let me ask this question. Are you walking alongside others to help bear burdens? Are you walking alongside others to help them care for, help care for them? That's what Paul's talking about. The first point, the first thing that we can see about doing good is doing good restores others to Christ. Pick it up in verse three. It says, for if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Well, verse three actually gives us the first warning that we're, that we're, that we're given about being deceived. And here's the warning. God's warning to us in this context is, do not think we're better than others. Don't think we're better than other people. He says, if anyone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. You see, sometimes we think we're something when we're really not. We're not really all that. That's the warning that Paul gives here in verse three. You know, Jesus had a similar warning back in the book of Luke. Luke chapter six, verses 41 to 42. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that's in your eye when you yourself do not see the plank that's in your own eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck that's in your brother's eye. Jesus says, he's speaking to the religious leaders of the day, the religious leaders of Israel. He says, you guys have a plank in your own eye. You're wanting to, to take care of this minor thing in someone else's life, bearing a burden. It's the right thing, but let's do it in the right way. Let's do it in the spirit of gentleness and in meekness and with humility instead of thinking we're all that and coming at it from a, a critical perspective or a judgmental perspective. Now, as we were studying through this, I was reminded of 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 14. And 1 Thessalonians 5 14, in, in that passage, Paul does an amazing job of giving a snapshot summary of verses one through three of Galatians six in this verse. So listen to what 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says. He says this, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted. Uphold the weak. Bear a burden and be patient with all. That's, that's essentially what Paul just said in those first three verses. You see, doing good restores others to Christ. That's the first thing that we see. So let's look at the second thing that we can see about doing good versus being deceived. Here's our second point. Doing good invests in things of the Spirit. Doing good invests in things of the Spirit. 
Look at what Paul says, starting in verse four. He says, but let each one examine his own work and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Verse five, for each one shall bear his own load. Okay, wait a minute. We just spent a lot of time talking about bearing each other's burdens. And now Paul says, seemingly contradicts himself. And he says, uh, each one should bear his own load. He seems to shift. First of all, in verse four, he shifts to this whole idea of self-examination. Because he says, examine your own works. Look at your own deeds. Make sure you're, you're, you know who you are, right? Verse three, he says, consider, or verse one, he says, consider yourself. Verse four, he says, examine your own work. Then he says in verse five, each one shall bear his own load. Now the word translated as load here is, it, it's this idea of having a specific quantity or a smaller quantity that, that, that one person could carry. It was used in the day to talk about a knapsack or a, a, uh, or a backpack or something like that. And it, the, it was the word that's used in other scriptures as well. In total, if you look at the Greek word that's translated load here, and you look at the other places in the Bible that it's translated, which by the way, is a good tip of Bible study. Because if you come to a passage and you say, ah, this doesn't make any sense, or it seems like Paul's contradicting what he just said, take a look at that word and how it's translated in other places throughout the Bible. And it gives a glimpse into what that word means. And it typically will open up a pretty good idea what the, the author is trying to say in that context, okay? So let's take a look. I've got two verses that I wanna highlight. Other places where that same word that's translated load in Galatians 6, 5 is translated in different ways in other passages, two, two passages. Matthew eleven thirty. Jesus is talking here and he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay, so Jesus says in that context, it's a, it's a light burden, something you can carry. But then over in Matthew 23, 4, it's talking about the Pharisees or the, or the lawyers. It says, they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear. Well, these are heavy burdens, right? It's the opposite of being light. Here's what I think is happening. I think yet again, Paul is showing the Galatians how to walk with Christ. Paul's showing Galatians, the Galatians and, and by default us, what it looks like to live in freedom. You see, Doing good and specifically investing in the things of the Spirit means that we walk with God. And when we walk with God, we allow Him to help carry our heavy burdens. It's not that the burdens go away. It's that the burdens are, are, are being, we're being helped to carry those burdens. Jesus is carrying those. The thing that makes it so that we can bear those burdens is that Jesus helps carry those loads. As I was thinking through this illustration or this concept, I, how many of you have ever had your small child help you uh, do something, <laughs> right? Help you do something. So imagine having a wheelbarrow of, of dirt that you're moving and your three-year-old is helping you, right? So they're standing in front of you. They've got their hands up on the wheelbarrow. Their, their, their feet are barely touching the, the, the ground and you're behind them and you're lifting it. Now your, your son or daughter, it's not a heavy load for them, is it? but they're also not carrying much of it. You see, it's a light load, it's a manageable load. They're, they're just going about thinking this is great because you're behind them and you're doing the heavy lifting. You see, that's what Jesus wants us to do. That's what he says, let each man bear his own load. Well, it's not that we're doing it ourselves, it's doing it, again, Galatians 5, as we walk in the spirit, as we walk with Christ, as we allow him to take those loads and we rest in him, that's what he's talking about here. Then, then Paul kind of gives a specific example of doing good as we shift into verse six. He says, let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Paul says, do good to those who teach you the Bible. Do good to those who are investing in the things of the spirit in your life. That person that's discipling you, your small group leader, that the person in, your, in your, your, your class that's teaching the word of God, anyone who teaches you the Bible, Paul says, do good to them. Share in all good things. Do things that are valuable and good for them and to them. Now, Paul's making a couple of assumptions here. Number one, he's making the assumption that we're learning the Bible, 
<laughs> one. And number two, he's making the assumption that we're teaching others the Bible. It's a similar encouragement that he gives in 2 Timothy 2 too. It's a verse that may be familiar to you. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2 too, and the things that you've heard from me among, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You see, doing good is investing in the things of the Spirit. And the, the things of the Spirit involve not only helping bear our own burden as we walk with Christ, but the things of the Spirit involve teaching others the Word of God, teaching the Bible to other, question, other, other people. So the question is this, who are you teaching the Word of God to these days? Who are you teaching? Are you learning the Word of God these days? And then finally, are you thankful in that? Are you grateful for that learning, for that teaching? And have you communicated that to the person that's teaching you? That's what Paul's saying. You see, when we teach God's word, others are restored to Christ, which by the way, ties back to the first point we talked about, doesn't it? All right, so Paul goes on then in verse, verses seven and eight, and he addresses this warning, the, the warning that we're talking about. And here's the warning in this context. Okay, doing good, is, it, 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 doing good is investing in the things of the Spirit. But the warning is this, don't forget we'll reap what we sow. Don't forget we'll reap what we sow. Galatians 6 verse 7, Paul says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Verse 8, For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap reap life everlasting. Paul says, we will reap what we sow. Those things that we do are going to come back to us. We will reap what we sow. You know, if we, if we reap those things of the flesh, Paul says, you're going to sow corruption. Those things that we talked about last week about walking in the, in the flesh, when those things are Mark, mark our life, we can expect there's going to be corruption, there's going to be devastation, there's going to be difficult times that come. But Paul says, if we sow to the Spirit, you know what we're going to reap? We're going to reap life, everlasting life. Life ensues when we walk in the Spirit and when we sow to the Spirit. So if we want to do good, invest in the things of the Spirit. Okay, now let's talk for a minute about what does it take to do good? I mean, what, what's even required to do good? I think we see this in verses nine and 10 as we finish out the text. Here's our point. Doing good requires God's perspective. Doing good requires God's perspective. Look what Paul says in verse nine. He says, and let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Verse 10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, these verses show the need for God's perspective. And it shows the need for God's perspective in two time frames. First of all, verse nine, Paul says, let us not grow weary while doing good for in due season. Well, that's a future context, isn't it? In due season, at some point, this is, this is gonna happen. You see, doing good requires God's perspective for the future. But doing good also requires God's perspective in the moment. Because look what he says in verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, as those opportunities come up, as it pops up here or pops up here, as we have opportunity, do good. You see, doing good requires us to have God's perspective on, on life, on eternity, on our life right now, on today, on tomorrow, on next year, and ultimately on eternity. And we also see God's warning in this section. Here's God's warning. Don't grow weary doing good. Don't grow weary doing good. You see, sometimes it gets, sometimes it gets difficult to continue doing what God wants us to do, doesn't it? Sometimes it happens. And when we're walking with God, that burden, yes, it's light. But sometimes when we're investing in the things of the Spirit and we're investing in other people, sometimes we might be tempted to say, is this person ever gonna grow? Is this person ever gonna change? 
Will I always be the one that has to initiate this? Why do I always have to give and I, I never receive? We start th- say, saying things like, is my spouse ever gonna come to the Lord? We start growing weary and doing good. And we say things like, oh, will my kids ever follow the Lord? Is my son, is my daughter ever gonna, fo- ever gonna come back to the Lord? Sometimes the warning that Paul's giving us is sometimes those things are difficult and challenging. And he says, don't grow weary in doing good. And when someone's not growing in the, the time frame or in the way or as quickly as you want them to, if someone's not responding in the way that would be best or that you would like or that's even right, Paul says, don't grow weary in doing good. Don't grow weary. He says, keep doing good. Keep st- Keep, keep trying to restore others to Christ. Keep pointing people to other, to God's word. Keep investing in the things of the spirit. Keep doing good. You know, over in James chapter five, verses seven to eight, I'll just read it. It's a, you can just write it down if you'd like. James says, be patient then brothers and sisters until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. James compares this whole idea to a farmer who goes and and, and plants a crop. And the the farmer, when he plants his crop, doesn't come back next week and say, what, this thing, why why can't I not harvest this? I planted this thing last week. We would think the, the, the farmer is crazy. It's not logical. You see, the crops come up. Number one, they take time. Number two, they take nurturing. Number three, they take watering. There's a whole stack of things. And eventually, those crops come up. And there's a harvest that's, that's, that's available. And the difficulty is that sometimes we get weary in doing good. We are investing in people and it's not going the way we want it to or as quickly as we want. And we get weary. And we stop. And we give up. And the warning here, Paul says, don't give up. God says, don't grow weary in doing good. So let me ask you this. Are you restoring others? The three ways to do good. Are you restoring others? Are you bearing the the burdens of others? And are you doing it in a way that's with gentleness? In a way that, that pulls them in and says, you know what, I'm gonna come alongside you. I wanna restore you back to walking with Christ. Are are you investing in the things of the spirit? Are you resting in Jesus and allowing him to make your loads light? Whatever your burdens are, we all have them. But are you walking with him and saying, Jesus, I can't carry this one, but I need you to come alongside me just like we come alongside that child with the wheelbarrow and we pick it up and it's like, oh, this is light. Are you teaching the word of God? Are you being taught the word of God? And are you grateful to those who are investing in you? And finally, do you have God's perspective? Do you have God's perspective on doing good? Do you have his perspective for the future? Do you have his perspective for for today? That you say, I'm gonna keep doing what God called me to do. I'm gonna keep doing what he asked me to do. And guys, here's the reality. There's a freedom in that. There's a freedom in it because the results are not ours. Ours is only to say, God, I'll do exactly what you want me to do and I'll keep doing good and the results are yours. Just like that farmer plants that seed, but he he doesn't control the results. He just comes back and he keeps cultivating it. That's what God calls us to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your goodness and your graciousness in our lives. And Lord, thank you again for this book. Thank you for the principles that are found in it. Thank you for the practical nature of it, that it can apply to our lives every moment. And Lord, I pray that you would take this passage, that you would take these principles and that you would do something in our lives and in our hearts, that you would do exactly what you want done. And Lord, I pray that you would give each one of us the courage to respond to whatever it is you're speaking to us about. Lord, we lift all this to you in Jesus' name, amen.